then you need to, when you're getting ready to medicate, um, in this case, uh, the medication that was ordered was called Versed, um, which is the trade name. Midazolam is the generic name. And the difference of that is that drug companies come up with the generic name of midazolam, and then I don't know why they come up with a different drug, the different name and call it Versed, but they do. So both names um, are familiar to everyone in regard to the, to the medication. In this particular uh, situation, she went to the automatic dispensing system and pulled, I, I don't know whether she typed in VE, Versed, because there's been different stories in that regard. What I do know is that the, the automatic dispensing system, or PIXIS, uh, automatically, automatically diverts to generic. They're divided in two things, generic, and trade or brand name. And it automatically um, reverts to the generic drugs. So it would come up, if you're wanting Versed, you have to type in midazolam. You'll never get it on the generic side of it if you type in Versed. You'll never get that because it'll always, always come up midazolam. Now, if you want to type in Versed, you then have to convert to the uh, trade side of the PIXIS system and type in Versed. Apparently, from my understanding, she went in and typed in either VE or Versed, and what happens is that every single drug listed comes up, that starts with the V, comes up. So you have to go through and if she did that, it would never have, she would never have found Versed on the generic side. So she pulled out a drug, the first drug she saw, and it happened to be Vecuronium, which is a paralytic agent. This goes back to Nursing 101. When you're pulling out a medication, now everywhere I've worked, and I've worked in a lot of places over my 47 years of being a nurse, it would be in a locked room. Some places don't have locked rooms. So you can go in, you key in to the locked room, you go in, so you have no other distractions. You're focused 100% on what drugs you need to pull out of that system. And that is one thing you learn in the Nursing 101. One of the first things you learn in uh, administering medication is not to be distracted by anything else. And if you're in the medicine room and two or three other nurses come in, your responsibility is to say, I'm doing my meds, you guys are talking, step outside, I don't need to be distracted. We have to read the name of the medication because people make mistakes. Uh, when an order is written, the physician writes the order. So that's the first thing that's done. Sometimes physician may make a mistake. Instead of writing 1.0 one milligram, one point zero milligram, he may write 1.0 milligram, which means the patient is ordering is ordered 10 milligrams, which is obviously not correct. So the, the, the second safe fail is the pharmacy, who then is responsible for knowing what the drug is and realizing that 10 milligrams of this particular drug is way too much. So I need to notify the physician and let them know uh, that they have ordered the wrong amount. Now, sometimes pharmacy makes mistakes. Sometimes when they're filling the, the AccuDose system, they put the wrong drug in the wrong pocket. So it's a responsibility that for the nurse, who is the third cell fate, uh, fate fail safe, fail safe uh, in checking that they're getting the right drug. And you do that by reading the name of the drug that's on the vial. Where he or she is not familiar with the particular drug to be administered. 
When you don't know what the drug is, you need to look it up. If you don't know, for example, I'm sorry, my voice is very weak. Um, if you don't know what the drug is, you um, need to look it up because you need to, to know what the side effects are, what the risks are of getting, giving the medication. Now, when I started out with nursing 47 years ago, um, we didn't have computers that so we could just go to any computer and type in the drug, like Google it, and it pops up. We had to go find what's called the physician's desk re reference, look up the drug, and find out what all the side effects and the risks of giving the drug was. But now we have Google, so it's easy to walk to any computer, type in the word Versed, midazolam, and look up to determine what the side effects are of the medication. I have never seen the drug in a powdered form. It has always been in a liquid form. All right, we'll, we'll switch gears here a little bit. Please discuss uh, how the defendant failed to meet the standard of care by failing to follow the guidelines established by Vanderbilt University Medical Center regarding proper utilization of the uh, automatic dispensing system, also known as active the way this system is set up is that you go into a secured area and uh, you type in your code or sometimes now they use your fingerprint and what pops up is a screen. You type in the patient's name and what pops up then is all the medications that particular patient is on. So you scroll down, you find out that the patient is to receive midazolam, you push that on the screen. It, um, and uh, the big drawer opens up, and then the drawer, because there will be like five or six drawers, the big drawer will open up, and a pocket will pop up that says midazolam. Well, it doesn't say that, but it opens, because that's the drawer that they're kept in. And once again, you take it out, and you have to look at it, because I said sometimes pharmacy makes mistakes. So we are the third stop in regard to giving the medication. Only in an emergency situation. And what should be done if a prescription has not been submitted to the automatic dispensing system for immediate access? Well, if it hasn't been automatically sent to the system, there's no way you can get it out. So you need to call the pharmacy and say, <coughs> you know, I got to give this medication. Um, it's uh, midazolam, one to two milligrams. Can you put it in the system so I can get it out? Now, why is it important for a nurse to understand the difference between a generic and a trade or a brand name drug uh, when using the automatic dispensing system? Well, we're trained to know both the um, generic name and the trade name. Now, when I first started out, I mean, everything was under the trade name. But in the last, I don't know, 20 years, they have converted to using the generic name of medications. So therefore, if some, you need to know both because somebody might write down Versed as an order when it actually, you know, that it's not listed as that in any system. So therefore, you have to look Midazolam up. I'm sorry, say again. Start from the beginning. Can you explain how the defendant fell below the standard of care when not scanning the patient's wristband before administering medication? Okay, so this is a fourth fail safe. By scanning the wristband, you know you've got the right patient. Because as a nurse, the buck stops with me. I'm the one giving the medication. 
therefore I need to make sure every other step along the way has been correct. So when I pull that medication out, scan the patient, scan the, uh, the uh, medication, it all connects. It's a fail-safe method of uh, making sure that uh, the wrong medication is not being given to the wrong patient. Now, Ms. Jones, what steps, if any, should a nurse take to ensure they are providing the proper medication if a scanner is not available? Well, first off, you shouldn't be giving the drug. You shouldn't just, if the scanner's not available, you shouldn't be giving it. Um, that's, in that case, you again call the pharmacy and saying, I can't scan this, and it happens so many times that you're trying to scan a medication and it won't scan. And you have to call the pharmacy and say, why is this not scanning? I'm standing here trying my best to scan it, and it won't scan. So can you correct that issue or come up here and fix it? Because i got to get this medication, and uh, I need to make sure that it's the right medication for the right patient. Once again, you need to call the pharmacy. You don't just go ahead and give the medication, but if, if it is absolutely essential that this medication needs to be given, then you can double check it. And you double check it because it's a high risk medication. And whether there's a scanner there or not, you need to double check that medication with a second healthcare provider. And she had a second healthcare provider with her, um, her preceptor. Darren. Explain how the defendant fell below the standard of care for not monitoring Ms. Murphy after she was supposed to have been given, supposed to have been given a benzodiazepine such as modafinil. We'll keep it simple. A benzodiazepine is a group name of a medication. There's several benzodiazepines um, and them, excuse me, fall in that category. Uh, so we'll keep it simple and just cause it, call it midazolam. With midazolam, it is considered a conscious sedation medication. And as a conscious sedation medication, it, those medications are generally given when a procedure is done, uh, like a colonoscopy, um, a endoscopy, going into a scanner that may take a while, which is also a procedure. So the, the uh, purpose is to uh, assess the patient beforehand, talk to the patient, hi, what's your name, uh, what are you here for, um, you know, what's the date, neurologically you check to make sure they're okay before you even give the medication. You check their blood pressure, their heart rate, um, their respiratory rate, and their oxygen concentration, you know, with that little thing that they put on the finger. So that way you know beforehand that the patient is perfectly stable, particularly if you don't know the patient. And I believe uh, Ms. Vault had never met this patient, didn't know anything about her, had just been asked to go down and give her the medication. So it's imperative then that you evaluate the patient and assess the patient and make sure that you're giving the medication to the right patient and that that patient is stable enough to receive this medication. Now, Ms. Jones, in this particular case, you, you had the opportunity to review Ms. Charlie Murphy's medical records. That is correct. And do you recall seeing a, an order placed within the medical record with respect to whether uh, a patient whether the patient should have been monitored or unmonitored. There's no order in the record saying the patient should be monitored or unmonitored. Now, was there any notation uh, in the record about Ms. Murphy going to the PET scan department unmonitored? Um, it was about 5.30 in the evening that Ethan Gulley documented that he had received an order at 10 o'clock in the, a verbal order at 10 o'clock in the morning saying that she could go to the cats, I mean the PET scan unmonitored. Now what does that particularly mean, unmonitored? 
you go down and they can just go without any sort of monitoring, any telemetry or anything. Now, you said that that notation, I believe, or that order was at 10 o'clock. The notation wasn't entered until, until 5. Excuse me, there was not an order at 10 o'clock. Okay. So there was a notation that was entered at 5 o'clock. Correct that at 10 o'clock a verbal order had been given to him. However, there is no order for her to go unmonitored. Now, assuming she, obviously she was not hooked up to the telemetry, at the time that the order for the midazolam was entered, in your opinion, does that change the situation as to whether or not the patient should have been could you repeat that? At the time that the order was entered, the midazolam order was entered for the patient at the PET scan area or for Ms. Murphy at the PET scan area, did it change, in your opinion, did it change things or, or change uh, perspective that she would need to be monitored at that time? Okay, so there was a note it, that at 5.30, that at 10 o'clock, uh, Ethan Gulley was given a verbal order that she could go unmonitored. The order for the midazolam was written at around 2.30, I think, about that time. So we're talking a four-hour difference. Once that order was written for her to receive midazolam, a conscious sedation medication, she would have needed to be monitored, not necessarily by telemetry, but on the four things that I told you earlier. You need to monitor her blood pressure, her heart rate, her uh, respirations, and her um, oxygen concentration. And when you're giving a um, conscious sedation medication, you also need to have rescue equipment in case there is an issue uh, with uh, the patient having respiratory distress or an allergic reaction or whatever. So the respiratory equipment that would be needed would be oxygen, and you can provide that through what we call a bag valve mask or an AMBU bag. And you also need to have a um, defibrillator in case you need to uh, resuscitate her with a defibrillator. Those need to be close by when you're giving a drug like Verse said, midazolam, which is a high-risk medication used specifically for conscious sedation. Now, were you present in the courtroom when uh, the pet technician, Rebecca Smith, testified? Yes, I was. And explain to the jury, please, why are pet scan technicians not allowed to administer a controlled substance? Well, they're not. Even monitor they're not allowed to control, give any medications, not only a controlled substance, but any sort of medications, because that's what, not what they are trained to do. They're radiology techno, tech, techs, so their job is radiology. It is the nurse's responsibility to administer medications. What was the second part of your question? Or just in monitoring. Same thing in regard to monitoring. They're not trained to monitor the patient. And I believe um, Rebecca even stated, yes, she knew how to take a blood pressure and knew how, you know, to take check a pulse, but really didn't mean anything to her. Now, please discuss why the defendant failed to meet the standard of care when she didn't check the high-risk medication prior to administration. Say again, please. Please explain how the defendant failed to meet the standard of care when she did not check the high-risk medication prior to administration. Once again, the standard of care requires you to check all medications, but specifically high-risk medications, so that you can be assured that you are giving a medication specifically for this patient. And with high-risk medications, they really need to be double-checked with another healthcare uh, person. And what are the necessary protocols in place when removing a medication from the automatic dispensing cabinet? 
um, the protocols in place is that, I think this is what you mean, <laughs> it is to uh, look at the medication, see that you've got the medication, and uh, then take it to the patient, scan the patient, scan the, scan the medication. Is, is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was answering it appropriately. Now, were you present for the testimony of Darren Crooks? Yes. Specifically that he was present during the preparation and administration process of the medication. That is correct. What should the defendant have done prior to administering the medication when another RN was present at her side? Um, the defendant was a uh, well-educated, uh, well-respected nurse at Vanderbilt, so well-respected that she was given the job of being a preceptor or a trainer of new nurses. And so as being a well-respected, well-educated nurse it was, and a, a preceptor, it was her responsibility to make sure that um, the person that she was training understood everything that needed to be done in regard to taking out a medication. Now, Mr. Crook stated that he had already gone through that. But, you know, we're nurses. You need to drill these things into people. You don't just say, well, yeah, I learned that. And at this point, she was taking out a drug that she was overriding. So there was no indication from him that he had ever taken out a drug that was overriding. And I believe, and he had only worked there for a few weeks, and I believe Terry Bozen yesterday said there was only a 3% um, ability to override medications during the month of December. Now, Ms. Jackson, I want to talk about a little bit about Baker on your right front line. Are you uh, aware or familiar with that particular drug? Yes, I am. And have you utilized that particular drug under a physician's order? Or yes. Can I come down there too? That's what? Okay. I'll get to those in a minute. Yes, don't trip on that. Somebody already did yesterday. <laughs> okay. So, so when you first start out at an extreme, anyone that takes you, first thing you do is you go in and wash your hands. It's the most important thing, washing your hands. And then you have to put your gloves on. First off, she goes into the room, or I would go into the room, and I go, hmm, all I've got is normal saline here, red flag, I need sterile water. But apparently she overlooked that, and um, she then picked up the vecuronium, and you start to inject or mix the vecuronium, and you need saline, or as I said, sterile water. But in this case, she's got saline, so she went ahead and injected it. So there's also a little cap on there, so you have to take that cap off. So when you take that cap off, it goes, hmm, a, a paralyzing agent, warning, second red flag, okay? So then you put the needle in, and you're still looking at it saying, paralyzing agent, warning. So you're still seeing it. So you inject the solution, the normal 
constituted it after reading how to reconstitute it on the back of the bond. Okay? So that's the next thing you need to do. It's a warning. It says, Becuron, I'm having trouble saying, so just be patient with me. Becuronium bromide may cause respiratory depression. Third warning, can cause respiratory depression right there on the back of the vial. So she's still looking on how to reconstitute. So the next line says, reconstitute it with supply bacteriostatic water for injection. Oh, wait. All I have is normal saline. I don't have bacteriostatic water. Another red flag. And then I look at the front of it. It says Vecuronium bromide for injection. Um, for use, protect from light, one milligram per one ml. So that means if you put 10, uh, this is all divided in 10 cc's. This is how these secret syringes come, one to 10. So if you're putting all of it in, you're putting in 10 milliliters cc's into the bottle. So that means you've got one milligram equals one milliliter of cc. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So you put that in, you're now getting ready to inject it. So you pull it out, you go over, you have to go, first, let me just back up, you need to clean the top of this with alcohol before you put the needle in. You then go over to the patient. And remember, I told you it was up on her left side of her neck. So you really need to clean that cap off the rest of the uh, catheter that's in your neck, so you need to pick that alcohol swab and clean that before you inject the medication. Did this have a cap on it? Three or four times. Now, please describe how the defendant failed to ensure that Miss Murphy was free from abandonment and neglect. So, a nurse's responsibility when you um, assume care of a patient you need to make sure that they're safe and that nothing is going to happen to them. And regardless of where they are, if you're the one, excuse me, responsible for their care, you stay with that patient, particularly if you're giving a high risk conscious sedation medication. You don't just walk off and leave the patient after you give the medication. And does this matter when the patient is not necessarily no, it doesn't matter. Once you're responsible for the patient, you're responsible for the patient. She assumed responsibility for that patient when she, when um, Ethan Gawley asked her, asked Ms. Fault to medicate her with this high risk conscious sedation medication. She assumed responsibility for that patient. Yes, I have. Now, what does that order mean to you, and how would you effectuate administering that medication? How, how would I do what? How would you effectuate administering that medication pursuant to that, that doctor's order? Okay, so the order, when you look at it, the first word you see is midazolam. That's the order. Beside the order, it says Versed. But if you're looking at the order, the first word you see is midazolam. So the order is one to two milligrams. 
So what you do is that you give the first milligram, one milligram, give that to the patient. You have to, it takes about uh, two to three minutes for it to get into the system and have an effect on the patient. And, uh, well, first off, it takes, let me rephrase that. It takes, you know, you're supposed to give it slowly over, like, a two-minute period. Um, so you give the medication, and then it takes about two to five minutes for the, pe for the medication to become effective for the patient. So you would have to be there at least five minutes to determine whether or not that first milligram worked that you are giving the patient. If that first milligram hadn't worked, then you would be giving the second um, dose of the medication, and which would be a total of two milligrams. Uh, and um, once again, you have to wait two to five minutes to determine whether or not the medication had worked. So you have to stay there with the patient, assess the patient, check their vital signs, um, make sure that, you know, ask them questions, are you awake, are you alert, do you know where you are? And conscious sedation is kind of like a twilight sleep. So you're kind of awake, but you're still completely out of it, and you're not aware of anything that's going on, but you can still answer questions. There wasn't anything documented in the entire record that this woman had received uh, either vecuronium or ver Versed, not in a note, not in the MAR, not anywhere is it documented that this medication or any medication was given to her while she was in the PET scan area. Now, why is it important for a patient to have an accurate and complete medical um, the reason you have a medical record is for continuity of care, that you need to document what's going on for the pa with the patient so anyone who follows you can go back and read and find out what happened, why it happened, and what they need to do to care for this patient in the future. Now, you know, a lot of times we have the patient three days in a row or two days in a row, and then somebody else may come on the next day. And then a third person may come on the third day. So that first, second, third person can go back and look at all the documentation on the record to determine what went on with the patient. It's not always passed on verbally. And, you know, it has to be documented. You remember uh, musical chairs or, or, no, the whisper game, where you would whisper in someone's ear, would whisper in somebody else's and all the way. When you got to the end, whatever that first person said was completely different from what the last person received. So you definitely have to document everything so that you know exactly what happened. Passing it on verbally is not how you do it. Yeah, I think there was mention by, by the defendant in one of your first statements that she was advised by a supervisor not to scan the medication, uh, that it was documented on the MAR, obviously, when she pulled it from the override. In your opinion, does that relieve a nurse or the defendant of her obligation to perfect an accurate record? No, because you can still document a note. The MAR is different in the medical record as opposed to where you write notes. So you can still document in a note what was, what was or was not given and what happened to the patient to have a complete medical record. Now, Ms. Jones, uh, there's been some discussion uh, throughout this trial about a Veritas report. What is the purpose of a Veritas report? A Veritas report is an inner hospital record also known as an incident report or a variance report that is used for uh, learning, um, quality assurance, and teaching so that you can, so that the hospital knows this variant happens and now we need to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So it's an inner hospital uh, document that is used for a learning process. It's not a personal document for whoever wrote it. It is for a teaching uh, process. Now, 
Ms. Jones, based upon uh, all of the incidents that occurred on December 26 of 2017 involving the defendant and the medical administration, uh, administration uh, to the patient, based upon a reasonable, de reasonable degree of nursing Absolutely, in all areas. Have you had the opportunity to review the Tennessee statute and definitions pertaining to gross neglect and impaired adults? Yes. And based upon our actions falling below the standard of care, as you've already discussed, do you opine that the defendant committed gross neglect when she failed to provide the services necessary as a caregiver? to maintain the health and welfare of the patient, Charlie Murphy? Yes, I do. Now, Ms. Jones, just to make things one clear, you were compensated for your testimony here today, is that correct? That is correct. Good morning. As an expert witness, you were able to be in the courtroom and hear the testimony of all the witnesses. Is that right? That is correct. You've been with us since the beginning of the trial on Monday. Is that yeah, right? Yes, I have. It's been sort of a long, long process. Long week. So if I understood your testimony, you were suggesting that Nurse Vaught could have called from the first floor and told somebody to get the scanner fixed on the first floor. Was that your testimony? No, that was not my testimony. Okay. Then I must have misunderstood you because you know there was no scanner on the first floor. I don't know if there was no scanner on the first floor. There was no scanner in the PET scan area. Right. But I don't know if there wasn't, any, it, there wasn't one anywhere on the floor. I was referring to the PET scan area. And it's been established, and you heard it from the testimony, that there was no scanner on the first floor. That is correct. And based on your experience, that's a systemic problem that was occurring at the hospital in December of 2017. I can't say that it's a systemic problem because I believe um, Terry Bozer said that, uh, you know, when you think of a systemic problem, you're thinking overwhelmingly of a systemic problem. This seemed like a localized problem to me that there was no scanners on, in the PET scan area, not but, systemic. But as it related to Nurse Vaught, she did not have the benefit of scanning the medication or the wristband in the PET scan area. That is correct. So that would have given access to Ms. Murphy's electronic medical record on the first floor, is that right? I'm sorry, say again? That would, if, if she had had the ability to scan on the first floor, that would have given Nurse Vaught the access to the electronic medication administration record, correct? It would have given her the access, but you have to understand also, when you pull the wrong drug out of the medication, it pops up on the MAR. So if she had a scanner there, she could have scanned the ramp uh, armband, scanned the medication, and in the MAR system, it still pops up vecuronium. So it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't tell her she made a mistake. She would have still been scanning vecuronium. It would have told her, though, that vecuronium was not in the patient's profile, correct? That is not correct. It will tell her that it is an override medication that appears in the top of the MAR. 
Now, this all began with a doctor's order, is that right? That is correct. And that's Dr. Poya. Okay. And well, yeah, we'll that's Dr. Okay, you were here. Yes, I was. And, it and, is him. And his name has been mentioned a number of times, correct? Correct. And we've, ne we've never heard from Dr. Poya. Not during this trial, we haven't. But he's the one that made the order for Versed. One to two milligrams. Right. And he really made two orders, did he not? He made one order. Well, you've had a chance to take a look at the medical record. Yes. You've had a chance to take a look at the CMS report. The CMS report? No, I don't believe so. You've not looked at the CMS report? If I did, I don't recall. And so, so it's clear from the record you know what CMS is. Yes, I do. Centers for Medicaid and, and Medi Medicaid. Services. They're the ones that did the surprise visit late October, November of 2018 of Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Correct. You've heard that. Now, you've not looked at the CMS report? If I did, I don't recall. Okay. Um, there were really three versions, three iterations of the CMS report. You know, that doesn't ring a bell? I don't recall. Okay. And the last report consisted of over 300 pages. Does that ring a bell? I, I, it doesn't ring a bell. I don't recall if I looked at them. Where the, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid... Judge, if I could object, I think she's, she's advised us or tried several times that she does not recall these reports and doesn't recall the contents of them. But they're advancing her as... Cross-examination. I'll allow it. Cross-examination. Go ahead, Mr. Frank. So you don't know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. Have, in your experience, have you ever seen a CMS report? Yes. Okay. Where they come in and they identify deficiencies. Correct. Right? And it's sort of a two-sided sheet. Is that correct? Yes. Where the deficiencies are on one side and then the corrective actions are on the other side. Correct. Okay. And you did not review that document? Let me reiterate. I don't recall. Okay. So a document of that length, the, the format of the document as I'm explaining it to you would not ring a bell? Let me reiterate. <laughs> I don't recall seeing that document. So you are unaware that Dr. Poya put in two orders for the reset? Yes. You're unaware of that? I'm not unaware of it. There are two orders. One that's written, I think, at 1030 and then one that, or 10 o'clock or one that pops up at 11 o'clock. I thought you said a moment ago that you, that it was one order and you were pretty insistent about it. Well, there's one order, but it appears in the records a couple of times, but it still says midazolam versed one to two milligrams. Okay. What I'm asking you about is the, the order was this way. It was one to two milligrams and then it was clarified and made to be one milligram. Did you see that in the record? May I see that? Because I, I don't recall specifically. You, you, you talked about the literature that you rely on. Is that right? I told, I think I mentioned I did not rely on literature. I relied on my education, training, and experience. But, but early in your testimony, you talked about consulting literature in your field. Is that right? No, I did not say that. Okay. Well, uh, I thought that you were asked about a conclusion and you used the word literature, experience, education, and training. I don't think I said the word literature. Okay. Um, did you cite to any literature your expert report? Only, um, in regard to the definition of neglect. Um, and of course I looked up specifically uh, Versed and, um, and uh, Vecuronium. And you're familiar with the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, is that right? That is correct. And did you cite to that publication in your expert report? Yes, I did. Okay. And they've, they've written extensively about this case, is that right? I don't know how much they've written about this case. Well, did you access any of their literature to see if they had written about the I know there was an article written, I think I've got the date. If you want to wait a minute, I can tell you what it said. I just thought I might express your recollection about the two different orders. Once again, there was one order. 
but it was put in the record two different times, and I don't know why it was in the record two different times. Well, we don't need to quibble with that. Let me ask you another question. You were, you've been here throughout the trial. Yes. And you heard on the first day the first witness of Chandra Murphy, who is the daughter-in-law of Ms. Murphy, Charlene Murphy. That is correct. And she was rightly very concerned about her mother-in-law's issues with anxiety and her need for sedation for procedures and things like that. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. In fact, when they arrived from Sumner Regional to the Vanderbilt University Medical Center and were in the emergency department, that was the first thing that Chandra had told the emergency doctor. Is that right? I believe that is correct. So is it fair to assume that Dr. Coyle would have been aware of the fact that Ms. Murphy had this sensitivity and this anxiety? I can't recall if that was in the emergency notes or not, or if he was exactly the one who admitted her because it was a big team. But he could have easily looked back in the records and determined that. But he's the one that made the order we've been talking about, and he's the one in his professional medical judgment who said that she could be unmonitored. Is that right? I believe he said that she could be unmonitored. Well, wait a minute. Let's back up for a second. There is no order in the records that says that she can be unmonitored. There is no order. I've looked through those orders several times. There is a note that was written by Ethan Gawley at about 5.30 that afternoon that a nurse practitioner told him that she could go down unmonitored, and he documented that, that it occurred at 10 o'clock. Now, you've been here and heard the testimony, correct? Yes. And you heard Ethan Gawley's testimony. Yes. That Dr. Coya said that Ms. Murphy could be unmonitored when she went down to the PET scan. I'm just telling you what, yes, that's what he said, but the record said that she was, he was told that by the nurse practitioner. I understand what your testimony is, but I'm asking you about the testimony of Mr. Gawley. Yep, that's what. And the reason they have you in here as an expert throughout the whole trial is that you can form and express your opinions after you hear the testimony of the witnesses. Is that right? That was part of it, but not just the testimony of the witnesses, but also the records. All right, that's fine, but you don't think that Ethan Gawley was up here committing perjury that Dr. Coya told him that she could be unmonitored? That was told at 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. It was told, though. It was told. It was not an order anywhere that she could go unmonitored. And then you also heard the testimony of Mr. Gawley that he communicated that to Redonda Vaught. That is correct. And Redonda Vaught was concerned enough about it where she checked with him again and said, are you sure it's all right for this patient to be unmonitored during this procedure? I believe that is correct. And then there's this tension between the PET scan department and Gawley and Coya about the monitoring. Is that right? I don't recall anything that there was tension between the three of them. I do believe that the radiology tech called up and said, are you sure she needs to be unmonitored? That's what I was getting at, that the radiology people in the PET scan were uncomfortable. Correct. With this patient being unmonitored. Rightly so. And the testimony that you heard is that Redonda Vaught was out of that loop. She was utterly unaware of all of that. That is what I understand. So they're having a conversation, Gawley, Coya, and the PET scan people about monitoring or not monitoring, but Redonda Vaught is not part of that conversation. That is correct. But let me just also say that occurred at 10 o'clock in the morning. The order for the Versed did not come in until 2.30 in the afternoon. Therefore, any time is the responsibility of the nurse to monitor a patient who receives conscious sedation, whether the doctor says they can go unmonitored or not. 
Even though she had been explicitly told. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. She should have divined that. She should have known that. It's not divining it. It is knowing it. She said she's given birth said before, so she has to know if she's given birth said, the patient who is receiving conscious sedation has to be monitored. Okay. Even though Dr. Poya said no? Even though he said, once again, that was at 10 o'clock in the morning, not at 2.30 in the afternoon after the order was written. Okay. Now, you, you talked about these five rights of, of medication administration. Is that right? That is correct. And you found some, in, in your view, deficiencies in that. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Now, you claim in your report that Nurse Vaughn is guilty of gross neglect because she failed to document the administration of the medication. Is that right? That is correct. And you were here in the courtroom yesterday. Is that right? Yes. And you heard Diane Moat, the risk management person, testify. Is that right? That is correct. And did you hear her testify that um, Redonda had no opportunity to chart that medication? I'm not sure that she said that, that she said that when they got back to the floor, she filled out a Veritas report, incident report. At that time, she would have had the opportunity to document, I believe that's what she said. But at that point in time, according to Ms. Moat's testimony, they were resuscitating Ms. Murphy. The code team had been called, and she testified that Redonda Vaught had no opportunity to chart the medication. Well, let me just explain that the code occurred down in the PET scan, did not occur up on the floor. They came up on the floor, put the patient in the room, and Ms. Vaught did say that she assisted while she was in there once she found out that the um, wrong medication had been administered, that becuronium had been administered. She told Ethan Gulley, or Ethan Gulley told her, and then she told her charge nurse, and then she went to, I can't remember exactly what, the educational person and explained what had happened and filled out the Veritas report. She no longer had patient care. She was not getting patient care, giving patient care. It's not as if she went back on the floor and went back to work. Yeah, I think that was the point of Diane Moe yesterday, that she had no opportunity because she was out of the equation at that point. You're not out of the equation to write a note, ever. Well, let me ask you this. You heard Diane Moe's testimony. Yes. You heard her say that she had no opportunity to chart that medication. Well, I disagree with that. She did have the opportunity to chart no, that medication. I know you disagree with it. I'm saying, did you hear Diane Moe say that? I'm not quite sure she said that. But anything that Diane Moe said yesterday about Redonda Vaught not having the opportunity to chart it, does that change your opinion at all? Not at all. You seem pretty, pretty adamant about that. I am. It, okay. You always have time to document. You have time always, even if you do late documentation, you have time to document. But isn't part of this process of offering an expert opinion to gather all of the information and form a judgment? It is, but I will reiterate, documentation is very important, and you always have time to document, even if it's a late documentation. Um, you also claim that Ms. Murphy was abandoned by Nurse Vaughn, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Now, at the time that this Versed was administered, she believed she was administering Versed, this medication. Versed was not a high-risk medication at that time. I think what they said, that it was not a high-alert medication, which is different than being a high-risk medication. Well, they said it was not a high alert. Medication. That is correct. But that doesn't relieve you of the responsibility of monitoring a patient who has received the medication that is given for conscious sedation. And Ms. Murphy was going to be moving right into the PET scan area. Is that correct? I believe so. And she was in the PET scan area. I believe so. In 
in terms of the five rights of medication, are you familiar with what the Institute for Safe Medication Practices has said about the five rights? That they're important to follow those five rights. Have you read any of their articles about it? That by not following the five rights of administering medication increases the risk for um, injury to occur. Did you happen to read an article that they wrote about this case, the Redondo Vaught case, that was published February 14th of 2019? I don't believe so. And that is a respected publication in your field. So yes, it is. And the article is entitled, Another Round of the Blame Game, a Paralyzing Criminal Indictment that Recklessly Overrides Just Culture. May I see that? Yes, Okay. Did you hand it back to me? Are you familiar with the Institute for Safe Medication Practices? I'm slightly familiar with it. I don't know all the, the ins and outs of it. But they are a respected organization in your field. Yes, right? they are. say about the five rights in the Redonda Vaught case. Yes, Redonda did not complete verification of the five rights, which is a failing in any medication error. But the five rights are merely broadly stated goals that offer no procedural guidance on how to achieve them. Simply holding nurses accountable for following the five rights fails miserably to ensure medication safety. They are not intended to be an individual behavioral model for achieving medication safety, but rather goals for which organizations must accept responsibility and design safe systems in which they can be achieved. Okay. Do you agree with that? No. You do not agree with the Institute for Safe Medication? Well, I believe as a nurse it is your responsibility to know what the medications are that you give and to follow those five rights, that's something we, are, we learn very early in, in nursing school. You're not suggesting to this jury that Nurse Vaught consciously administered vecuronium to Ms. Murphy, are you? No, I'm not. But that's kind of like, you know, driving down the road drunk. You don't consciously plan on running into somebody, well, but a, you're not paying any difference. Well, that's true, but you're still held responsible for it, right. so, somebody, whether you mean to do it or not. Somebody has to consciously go into a bar and have drink after drink after drink to get into the condition and then go out and commit the crime. You're but they not, don't intend to do it. You're not equating drunk driving and vehicular homicide with a medication error, are you? All I'm saying is that they still don't intend to do it. I know she didn't intend to do it. I know that. Then, then why'd you bring up the drunk driving? Because okay. it's the same uh, thing. They don't intend to go out and kill somebody, even though they drank too much. She didn't intend to have this happen, despite the fact that she failed to do everything appropriately.
did you read the Institute for Safe Medication Practices article about the Tennessee Board of Nursing no. action involving nurse law? Take a look at this, and just so it's clear for the record, this is the article we're talking about. Okay. If you could hand that back to me. I want to read you a couple of passages and see if you agree with their assessment of the situation. The Tennessee Board of Nursing's disciplinary processes and judgment of Redonda Vaught's action during this event are not aligned with the tenets of just culture. Are you familiar with just culture? Not exactly, no. Okay. And you've been a nurse for 47 years? 49 years. 49 I, pra I practiced 47. Years. And you've not heard of just culture? I have, but I can't recall exactly what it said what it means. They go on to write in a just culture. Can you explain what just culture is? Just culture, my understanding of it, is that if there is an inadvertent error or a mistake, that the, the model is not to punish your way to patient safety. Okay. To recognize the problem and address the problem. Which is what you should do. But it just wasn't one mistake. <coughs> Just culture, inadvertent behavior, human error is not worthy of disciplinary sanction. And this is what the Institute for Safe Medication Practice is saying. Regardless of the outcome and the quality of, the quality of behavioral choices made during an event are thoroughly examined to determine whether there was a conscious disregard of significant risks. Also, disciplinary sanctions are not imposed for at-risk behaviors including not following the rules. Any system design failures that may have contributed to not following the rules must be examined and factored into the judgment of the behavior. Do you agree with that? Not completely. Okay. And I think in your analysis of this, you, you did not identify any system design failures that contributed at all. You've sort of excluded that from your analysis. No, I haven't. I clearly stated that the system design uh, failure was her not picking up the right medication. Right. But, but you're holding her responsible for not scanning in a department that didn't have a scanner. I'm holding her responsible. She didn't need to scan it so much as double check it double-checking it with the nurse that was with her. Am I giving the right medication? We can go upstairs and scan it when she comes back, but she had a nurse with her that she could easily have double-checked this medication, which is a high-risk medication. And I thought she said at the beginning of your testimony that if it was you, you would have gotten on the phone and complained about the I, scanner I not working. I would have complained about the scanner not working and having pharmacy come and tell me why it wasn't working, but she did not do that. And, and then when she got downstairs and found out there wasn't a scanner, she could have double-checked the medication with the nurse who was with her. So she could have called somebody and complained about a scanner not working that wasn't even there. Well, once again, I think what I was saying a scanner not working was just one of the examples I was giving. In this particular case, 
She got to the PET scan. There was no scanner. And so, therefore, it was her responsibility to double check the medication. Now, you heard the statement that was played to the jury yesterday, uh, Ms. Vaughn's statement to Ramona Smith. Two-hour yes, statement. yes. Not yesterday, day before. Forgive me, the day, the day before. Um, where she talked about immediately disclosing the error when she learned about it on the sixth floor. That is correct. And this article speaks about that. And let me read this to you and see if you agree with this. Healthcare practitioners, including nurses, will not want to speak up when they make an error which will cripple learning, prevent the recognition of the need for system redesign, and set the healthcare culture back to when hiding mistakes and punitive responses to errors were the norm. I agree with that. And from your review of this situation, Redonda's thoughts actions were completely the opposite. She immediately disclosed this error. Yes, she did. She didn't run for cover and not tell Dr. Neely and the team in Ms. Murphy's room that she had made this error. She that, fully disclosed it. That is correct. And after that, was interviewed by numerous people and fully and candidly disclosed what she did. That is correct. May I also say that in her interview uh, with the TBI agent, she admitted, admitted that she gave Acuronium instead of Versed. She admitted she had given Versed prior, and, but never Vecuronium. She admitted she was distracted. She admitted she shouldn't have been distracted with something other than the medication. She admitted she shouldn't have overrode the medication. She admitted that it struck her odd that she had to reconstitute the medication, didn't question that. She admitted she didn't recall anything on the vial to alert her, but should have recognized the difference, which it did alert her when it said on the top of the vial, paralytic agent. Um, she should have paid it. She admitted she should have paid attention and shouldn't have overrode the medication, that it wasn't an emergency. And she admitted she should have called the pharmacy to check the status of the order. She admitted all of those. She didn't do any of them. And in your view of this, she received no credit for that? She receives credit for it, but she still made the mistake of not doing any of it. Now, you talked about this vial. When she would have retrieved this vial, she would have had to have turned it this way, with the top down, correct, to insert the syringe with the sodium fluoride solution to mix it up. Is well, first she would have to have taken the cap off. So right. when she takes the cap off, you have to um, you have to see what's on the top of it when you're taking the cap off. When you're administering medication, I'm not quite sure how she had it. Did she hold it like this? Because you need to have it upside down to get all the solution out. I think she was putting solution in. It was Okay, that she was putting the solution in, so she still had to hold it up, and then she had to yes. roll it to shake it up. But she also said that she had to read the back to determine how to reconstitute it. Reconstitute it. And on the back of the vial, it says to reconstitute with sterile water. Well, instead of sterile water, she used normal saline, but the back of the vial doesn't tell you how much to put in there. She thought she was working with Merced, correct? That's what she thought. And she knew it was going to be one milligram that she was going to be administering. That is correct. So the amount of the solution that she was going to be injecting into the vial was really immaterial, correct? Not, no, not at all. Because the amount you put in is the directions that comes from the ph pharmaceutical company of how to reconstitute it. So if you're reconstituting it and it tells you only to put the five milliliters in of the, the, of the sterile water 
then you know that it's no longer one to one, that it's one to one and a, to one half. said that you reviewed the case documents in connection with your analysis. Are you referring to the list that I gave earlier? Yeah, your list. Yes. And the case documents include the CMS reports that I was talking about. Okay. So you would have reviewed those three CMS reports. Yes. Well, a while ago you said no. I said I didn't recall. Okay. But, so you're not recalling three different that is correct. There were so many things that I had to review and so many interviews that I had to listen to that I can't remember all, everything that was in every one of them. Uh, and I'm not expecting you to, Thank to you. remember everything. <laughs> I just was asking sort of on a macro level if you remember reading those CMS reports. And I said that I did not recall reading them. Right. That's fine. Um, the other question I have for you is this. Are you, were you familiar or are you familiar with the EPIC system? Um, just through reviewing uh, medical records, I've not used EPIC. You've not used EPIC. So if Nurse Bob would have had the ability to scan the medication there in the PET scan area, under the EPIC system, what would have happened would be that there would have been an alert because what had been um, requested would not have been in the patient's profile. That is correct. Profile. And I think Terry Bozen spoke of that yesterday. So that would have been another red flag that would have stopped this process. Yes, one of the many red flags that she encountered that would have stopped the process. But that didn't happen because she didn't have the ability to scan. Right, which is why she needed to double check it with the nurse who was with her.
Yes. And do you recall the defendant saying, I would have stopped along the way to see if anyone needed help with anything when I reached the sixth floor? Yes. So certainly she could have documented that administration's medication at that time. That is correct. Yes. And do you recall when Terry Bozen was posed the question, what happens if there is not a scanner available? She stated, double check the medication. That is correct. Now, Ms. Jensen, there was some discussion about removal of medication from the vial, from a syringe. What happens if you are removing, say, uh, one milliliter from a syringe and you accidentally get a little more than one milliliter? Where do you pl place the excess out of the syringe? We have to put it back in the vial because you have to account for, if you're, you're giving what she thought was Versed, which is a controlled substance, okay? So if you're giving a controlled substance and you've pulled too much out, you stand and you look at it while the needle is still in the, in the vial, to make sure you haven't taken out too much. And if you have taken out too much, you gently push back into the vial how much you didn't take out so that when you go back to count it as a waste, you know exactly. Because when you waste the medication, you know that you've given one milliliter equaling one milligram, so there should be nine milliliters left to check for you to see how much is left over and that none of it is gone. Yes, vaguely. Are you aware of how the nursing board in Tennessee disciplined this body? Yes, I do. Correct. Didn't the, the patient and the medication need to be present to do that? To document that you've given the medication? Yes. yes, you needed the patient to scan the bar, but you could still document a note that says, when I was giving this medication, unable to scan it, double-checked it with my coworker who was with me, and then when she got back up, scan it. Okay, thank you.